Bonjour Genie Engineers, in this video we're going to talk about soil classification and the five things that you need to know before you start classifying soil using either USCS or Ashdale. Now if you already know the concepts, I recommend that you skip this video and just go to the next video where we do practice problems. If this is your first time learning about soil classification or it's just been a while, I recommend that you stick around because it's important to understand the concepts before solving the problems. Now, um, if you're here for the first time and you want to learn more about engineering or just how to engineer your life better, don't forget to subscribe and make sure you hit the bell so you don't miss out on future videos. Now, let's get started. we're going to talk about is why do we need to classify soil so in certain engineering applications it requires certain soil properties that we need for whatever system we're dealing with so let's take a look at an example so here we have a dam with the centrally located core right so at the core so we have two soils here that is applied to the system so at the core we have a certain type of soil and at the outer shell we have a different type of soil so at the core we usually use something like clay because or a fine-grained soil and the reason that is is because we want water to be retained and usually clay have those properties it's when there's water clay usually expands and so when it expands um, it retains water as for the outer shell we need to stabilize the structure so to do that we actually need something more like grained uh, soil so more like gravel so if we look at the, another example like uh, buildings for example we definitely don't want to build with clay because it, clay can cause a lot of stability issues because it's it expands and shrinks what it can actually cause is um, differential settlement let's take a look at um, an example here so let's say we have a house here right let's pretend this is a house um, so it's okay if this house settles uniformly we have no problem usually houses settle after construction they settle a little bit because like all like the buildings and the, the live load or the dead load kind of settles the house now what we don't want is when a house settles um, at different like this side doesn't settle it stays where it is but then this side settles uh, it goes down right here and now this is usually our settlement and that's what's called uh, called differential settlement so we don't want this to happen because if the house settles so that means this moves so this moves down all the way down because of the the settlement and this right here stays where it is and so that causes a lot of cracks in your house if there's an earthquake it's gonna cause a lot more damage so you don't want that so that's why we try to avoid clay during construction or when we're building so here um so this this project had good soil so the foundation was uh very simple we just had like a a continuous footing around the parameter and then a four inch or five inch slab on grade for the second project however this one it had clay soil the water table was high and it was very contaminated water and really bad soil so what we ended up doing is we had to build a lot of piles as you can see these are all piles right here around the building to stabilize the building so that's why it's important to know what type of soil we're dealing with so that we can prevent any damage to whatever system we're working with. Next, we're going to talk about the two tests to classify the soil. So we have hydrometer analysis and we have sieve analysis. Now, this one, typically it's for particles that are less than 0.075 millimeters. And so what we do is that we take soil, we add water, and then we put uh, the hydrometer bulb in it inside the, the the soil and the water and then we take some recordings and there's some equations to uh, to determine what type of soil that is. We're not going to talk about this too much because it's usually for particles that are less than 0 0.075. So we're mostly going to focus on the sieve analysis which is for particles greater than 0 0.075 millimeters diameter. Now on here we have different type of sieves 
that have different type of diameters. So, and what you do is that you put the soil on top of the first sieve and then you shake it till you get um, to the bottom. So the soil usually with diameters that let's say higher than 3 8 inch, they would stay on the sieve. And if they're less, then they go to, down to the next one and so on till you have whatever left in the pan. So once you do that, usually you get this type of data. You get, uh, so here you have the US sieve, which is uh, number four, number 10, 20, 40, 60, and so on. These are the openings in millimeters. You have 4.75, that's the opening for each, for the sieve. And then from the experiment, you get the mass retained. So how much was it retained or how much it stayed on that specific sieve. So for example, on this one, on sieve number four, which is this one, zero, nothing stayed. Everything went down uh, to the next sieve. So then at uh, sieve number 10, we have 21.6 and so on. And keep in mind that these last sieves are usually silt and clay. They're fine grained. And, you, and the more you go up, the higher you go up, or the more you have of these type of soils, then you have more like coarse grain. So once you determine the mass retained from your experiment, then you start doing some calculations so you can get your percent finer. The reason why we need to calculate the percent finer because we want to get obtain a graph that is similar to this. And from this graph, we get two important uh, variables, which is uniformity coefficient and coefficient of graduation. So we usually need these two coefficients so that we can classify the soil using the USCS, which we'll see in a little bit. Uh, so to calculate the cumulative mass retained, so what you do is you do zero and then you add it to plus 21.6 and that gives you 21.6. Then you do 21.6 and then you add 49.5 and that's why it's, it's cumulative. You're trying to add all the mass uh, retained. Then you do, um, so you add this 21.6 plus 49.5, that gives you 71.1. Then you do 71.1 and then you add it to 102.6, which gives you 173.7. So you do the same thing throughout till the end. So at the end, we get 450, which is, this is your sum n. Oops. So this is your sum n right here. It's 450. So then you calculate your percent uh, finer, which is the sum m, which is 450 minus column d, uh, divided by 450. And you multiply that by 100 because we need a percentage. So let's take a, a, the first one and do as an example together. So we have 450, that's my sum of n, minus column D, which is zero. Then I'm gonna divide that by 450 and I'm gonna multiply it by 100. And then this is gonna give me, this cancels with this, or the my minus zero is whatever, 450 divided by 450, just one. One times 100, you get 100. So that's exactly what I have. So percentage, percent finer uh, for sieve number four, I have 100. And then you do the same exact thing for the rest of them. Once you get that, then you can graph pretty much what we do with this graph represents, so this is B, that's here, that's B. And then, and this column E is graphed here. So once you do that, so I have 100, that's for sieve number four, opening 4.75 for, uh, for approximately 4.75 is right here. And so that's where I have my point right there. And you do the same thing throughout. Now to get the coefficient uh, uniformity and graduation, we need three variables from this graph. We need D60, D30, and D10. And I'm gonna explain what these terms are exactly. So D60 is the diameter of the particle at 60% finer. And the same thing for D30 and D10. So D30 is just the uh, diameter of the particle at 30% finer. So let's let's look at it together. So I have 60 here, right? So if I 60% finer because I'm looking for D60, so I'm going to to kind of draw a line right here till I intersect my my graph. Once I hit my graph, I have it right there. Then I'm going to go down. And that gives me somewhere here, which is approximately 0.41.
Then you do the same thing for D30. D30 is supposed to be somewhere here, 30% finer. And then you do the same thing, you draw the line, and then you hit, uh, you intersect your graph, and then you come down so that you can find your diameter at 30% finer. So that gives you about 0.185. And then same thing we do for D10, which gives you something about 0 0.09. So once you get that, then you can just plug it in here. You do D60, which is 0.41, and then you divide it by D10, which is 0 0.09, and then you do the same thing for CC. So now that we determine these coefficients, we, you, we will see how we can use this uh, to classify soil using USCS. Now USCS stands for Unified Soil Classification System, and usually classifies two types of soil. We have coarse and fine-grained soil like we talked about earlier. Usually coarse, coarse grain is corresponds to either uh, gravel or sand and usually it's less than 50% that passes through the sieve 200. Meaning, so if you take a look at this, we have the 200 sieve here. If you shake that 200 sieve and the particles that on there, less than 50% passes through, which means more than 50% stays on the sieve or retained, that means you have cores. If you get 50 or more that passes through sieve number 200, that means you have fine-grained. So remember, if you get the number 50 or more, it's fine. If you get 49, that's going to be coarse. But if you get 50, it's not coarse, it's fine-grained. So be careful, you have to remember that. A lot of people would think it's 50% and then they would just use coarse grain, which is wrong. So fine grain usually uh, includes inorganic silt, inorganic clay, or inorganic silt and clay. So once you determine these, or you have an understanding of these, then you need uniformity coefficient, coefficient of graduation and liquid limit and plasticity index so that you can... Um, classify your soil so here we have the table so coarse grained so remember you don't need to really remember this because it's already on the table but you have to understand it so that you know how to use the table so this is really important so here we have coarse grained this is more than 50 percent note here that they use the term retained and not passes so be careful with this here however they use the term passes so this can be a little bit tricky especially under an exam and under the pressure so make sure you differentiate between the two this more than 50 percent retained it just really means less than 50 percent passes to the sieve 200 so it's the same exact thing here as you can see it says 50 percent or more passes to the 200 and this is defined as fine grain. Once you determine the gravel or if it's sand and so on, you get on here and this is when you start using your coefficient of uniformity and graduation and the liquid limit and plastic plasticity index. So this is why it's important to know those terms. When we'll do more problems, this these terms will become more clear. Uh, I also want to cover a little bit uh, the terms, so make sure you know what these really stand for because it just helps you understand, uh, have a better understanding of the soil. So G just gravel, S is sand, C is clay, M is silt, and O is just organic clay and silt. Now for W is well graded, P is poor graded, and then I think, I think we covered all of it. That is all for all you SES. So for AASHTO, American Association of State Highway Officials usually classifies the same type of soils. So we have 35% or less passes to sieve 200, and that is classified as granular. As for if it's 35% or more passes to sieve 200, then we have silt and clay. Now we also need to determine liquid limit and plasticity index, just as we did for USCS. But on top of that, we need this term group index, which is GI, which is something we're going to talk in a little bit. But before we do that, I want to go over the table. Now, the table, this I got it from, again, the same thing, the NCS handbook, and it's on page 156. So um, this is 
it tells you here this is granular material which is 35 percent or less passing to sieve 200 this is 0 0.075 is just the if you guys remember that's the opening in millimeters and the same thing here it tells you more than 35 percent now remember if you get 35 exactly 35 percent you gotta classify that as granular material not silt clay because here it says 35 percent or less but then on silt clay it says it has to be more than 35 that means anything greater than 36 goes under here anything 35 or less goes uh classif gets classified under these groups so keeping that in mind okay so let's talk about the group index so group index this is the equation we have this first term usually um it defines the liquid limit and then in this equation it defines the plasticity index so gi is just a way to evaluate the quality of the subgrade material usually for highways so there's certain rules that you need to keep in mind for gi some of them are covered here and some of them you just have to try to remember them uh, during if you're gonna take your fe so ge uh, if GI is negative or less than zero, then you just uh, assume it equals to zero. If GE yields a fra fraction, which means like if it's 2.2, you just round it up to four. Um, GI is equal to zero for certain for these type of groups, A1, A, A1, B, A24, A25, and A3. And GI is equal to uh, this, this part of the equation for a26 and a27 so the last thing we're going to talk about is Atterberg limit which just defines the water content at which fine grained changes its consistency if if we take a look at the uscs table as you can see here usually the plasticity index and liquids limits are for uh, the fine grained soils which we defined earlier it was silt and clay whereas for coarse grained usually you need uh, coefficient uniformity and gradation so just keep that in mind we have three types of Atterberg limits we have liquid limits plastic limits and shrinkage limit now when you go when you determine the water content from the liquid state to the plastic state that's called the liquid limit now water content from plastic to semi-solid is usually plastic limit and then you have shrinkage which is from semi-solid to solid state as your water content increases usually you get closer and closer to your liquid state once you determine the plasticity index which is liquid limit minus the plastic state then you can just use that for the uscs table to classify your soil now here we have a uh, these are two types of tests usually done to find the liquid limit and the plastic limit. I hope this video was helpful. Don't forget to do a lot of practice problems. If you guys have any questions, please leave it in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe, like, and make sure to share with your friends who might find it helpful. Thank you guys for watching and I will see you soon. A la prochaine.